Hello, Shalligators. Happy Coronation Day. Today, we're going to talk about, yeah, okay, a little bit about the coronation of King Charles III, just a few interesting tidbits about his predecessors, the other King Charleses, but who cares? I don't wanna talk about men, nobody cares. I wanna talk about the women of the monarchy, not Meghan Markle, because I don't care about her either. I wanna talk about Kate and Camilla, because these are two women who, against many odds, waited it out to get these men and are now at the top of the food chain in terms of the most one of the most powerful monarchies in the world. Are they the most powerful monarchy? In the, is there another one? I know that they're a parliamentary monarchy, blah, blah, blah. But tell me, if you happen to live in a country with a monarchy, please tell me what that's like. It seems so interesting. At this point, a king might be a wonderful change from whatever hellscape we've got going on in America. So we're gonna to talk today about waiting for a guy, waiting it out, waiting for a commitment, waiting for the circumstances to change, waiting for him to grow up. Does it make sense? I mean, it did for these two. Should you follow their example and wait for the man you truly love? Should you sink your teeth into something if the outcome is really worth it? How do you know when to cut and run? How do you know when to hang on? I can tell you. There's very clear situations where this will work and very clear situations where it won't. And if it's a situation where waiting is not the answer, I'm gonna tell you exactly what to do instead that will work. So we're gonna get into it, but before we do, you guys, join me in the Shalantourage. I have been on, I've honestly been on my bullshit. I know that's not a polite word to say when we're talking about the monarchy. I'm gonna to try to make this a prim and proper video. I will try, but I have been. I've just been ranting, I just, dumped somebody, I am about ready to cyber bully this girl who is really pissing me off, and you can hear all about it in the Shalantourage. Plus, I've come up with a new fabulous insult for a man. I, it's really good, you guys, it's really good. So, if you want five exclusive new videos a week from me, hear about all the inner workings that are going on, some pep talks every week, we've got Serene Sunday, Wisdom Wednesday, Evil Monday, you're gonna get all of that and more, plus access to so many new friends from around the world. Our group chat is lit all day long, it's the best. So, go ahead and click down below and let's make some international friends. It's truly like the best thing that I do, I love it, I love it. It's, I just, I just love the Shalantrash, it's so fantastic. Okay. Let's talk about this, this coronation. Oh, King Charles III. So, he is the third. King Charles II, we haven't had a King Charles since the 1600s, since the mid 1600s, King Charles II. And he really fought to get his crown back after Oliver Cromwell, have you heard his name? Yeah, Oliver Cromwell was a huge inspiration to the American revolutionaries because Cromwell and his anti-monarchy forces overthrew the king of England, right? Because they were fucking pissed about taxes. They were just like, Bleh. they were pissed about all these foreign wars. They were just, they're just super pissed. And they overthrew the monarchy. And at the time the king was King Charles the first. And that was the first and only time in British history that a monarch was beheaded, that they killed a monarch. Now listen, listen, for whatever reason, because I went down a rabbit hole about this. I don't understand why that statement is considered fact when King Henry VIII beheaded two of his queens. Like, why don't they count? And that was like a hundred years before. So I don't understand why that doesn't count. Oh, is it because they're women? And if you're, if you're British or, you know, you are a student of history, explain this to me because everything I have found said that like, like as a statement of fact, this is the only British monarch ever to be beheaded, ever to be executed. And I'm like, how is that? Are you guys forgetting some people? And nobody's ever been able to explain it to me. So if you can, that would be great. Thank you. So that's just your little historical tidbit for the day. Honestly, check out the podcast Noble Blood. I love it. She did, the chick who does it, she did an episode called The Desperate Young King Charles. And it was like years ago, but it's, history hasn't changed. So it's still evergreen. Like it still works. And I'm not a super royal enthusiast. The royals are enthusiastic about me, namely uh, Harry and Meghan, since Meghan put me in her documentary about what a fucking victim she is and implied I am running some sort of insane cabal against her. Girl, grow up. That's all I'm gonna say on it pending legal action, but I think I, think I am fine entering into evidence and having a court read back to me grow up. <laughs> yes, Your Honor, I said that. I said it many times and I meant it. 
Thank you. Is there another Bible you'd like me to swear? I will swear on as many. Is there a Quran? Is there a Jewish text? Anything. Anything you want to put my hands on? A phone book. Waffle House menu? I got it. I'll swear on it. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Megan because fuck her. I want to talk about Camilla and Kate. So I grew up in the time of Diana. You know, I was really young, but she was like the, I mean, she was a princess, you know, like you don't, you don't know about other princesses. And it was, she was beloved, but like, it was insane how the paparazzi stalked her. And I remember I was like six or something. And I remember seeing on the cover of like the National Enquirer at my grandmother's beauty salon when I would go with her, that it was like a hidden camera photo of her at the gym. And it was like this weird, it was like a weird upskirt kind of shot. And it's like, I, I was so young and I was like, what is that? Like, why would someone want a picture of that? It's, I, it's never made sense to me the way the paparazzi hounded that woman. And I think we've had like a Princess Diana renaissance, you know, with the crown coming out and the Spencer, the movie and all of, all of these Princess Diana things and kind of the same way we've had a Marilyn Monroe renaissance. And I think people are sort of looking at her through kind of a different lens now. Personally, the lens I am looking at Princess Diana through is not a great one. Do I think she had the easiest life? Of course not. Of course not. I have said from the jump that being a royal seems unbearable. I was talking to uh, somebody on my team and they live in London. I was like, are you going to watch the coronation? And he's like, no. And I was like, how long is it? He's like, I don't know, like five to eight hours. I'm like, can you imagine having to go to that? He's like, no, it seems awful. I'm like, yeah, that seems like a nightmare. And if you were a royal, that's your whole life. It's just ceremony and wreath laying and community center opening and alpaca farm. It's just over and over again. It's boring thing after boring thing. Ugh, I, ugh. It's not even cool anymore. I guess it, it would have been cool back in the day when people were like dying of scurvy and the plague. And it's like, damn, like you get to eat meat. This is, this is great. But now that the world has like evened out a little bit more and people have so many more opportunities as commoners, I just don't know why you would want to be in the monarchy over honestly being an influencer or a celebrity or an athlete or a rapper or a tech bro or something like that. I don't know. It just seems, it's just seems like it sucks. So I feel for Diana in that. It seems like her life was very controlled, very stultifying. You shouldn't wear that. Don't say this. Da, 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 da. I get that. I get that. I also get that some people have real problems. I also get some people have real problems. And I, I think somebody who did have a real problem Listen, you might not agree with me. I think the person was Charles. Charles never, ever had a choice. Diana had a choice. Granted, she was 19 when she married him. I get it. Like, as much choice as we have when we're 19 and we're just like, you know, in this washing machine of emotion and experience, for sure. But she had the option, she did, to divorce and to leave. And she could leave that life behind and never have to deal with it again. He never ever had that option. Never. And as someone who is so punchy about, don't tell me what to do! Ah! Like, I cannot abide people telling me what to do, figuring out my path for me. I can't handle it. The idea of my life being planned out for me in that kind of way, I just don't even, I don't know how you would deal with it. I can't believe he's as normal as he is. I can't believe any of them are. Like, I truly cannot believe their concept of duty. And I am so in awe of it in a really admirable way. Like I really, that is something that is so mind blowing to me, the concept of duty. And I love Winston Churchill. Like I'm a big Winston Churchill, like enthusiast. And he has a quote that I love. I had it on my wall in college. I was a virgin, what a surprise. It was, we must abandon the word reward and return to the word duty. <sighs> Gives me goosebumps. I love it. I love it. Return to the word duty. And to me, royals, royals don't leave that word. And that's why I look at Harry and Meghan. I'm like, you guys are gross. Harry, you're gross. Abandon the word reward. Return to the word duty. So I feel for Charles in that he had a love of his life, Camilla, and he couldn't marry her. And for us 
as normal people who get to wear what we want and go where we want and do what we want and whatever, the concept of someone being like, no, you can't marry that person. You have to marry this person. We're like, fuck you, go fuck yourself. I mean, maybe we are, or maybe this is something that is resonant for you. Maybe you're like, no, no, I am Jewish and I brought home a Baptist one time and boy, oh boy, it was very clear that wasn't gonna happen again. I mean, maybe this really hits, but for me, the concept of somebody telling me that they are deciding the most intimate thing in my life, just uh, is unfathomable to me, unfathomable to me. And it would be hard enough to know that you couldn't be with the woman that you loved. And then you're in the house with the sourpuss all the goddamn time. And listen, I understand why she was, I understand she, her husband was in love with someone else. I get it. We've all been in those relationships where you're being gaslit and he's like, he's affectionate sometimes, but then other times like, Bleh. I, I've been there. I truly, I feel so sorry for both of them. And I think that this is kind of the first time culturally people have felt sorry for Charles. It's always been like, boo, mean old ugly Prince Charles and meh. I have a great amount of sympathy for him and I have a ton for Camilla. Now look, I know, I know. Fuck a side chick, right? Fuck a side chick. But they really loved each other. And fuck a side chick when the guy is perfectly capable of leaving his girlfriend or his wife. Fuck a side chick. That wasn't the case here. Or again, maybe I'm being a Charles apologist and he could have, he could have initiated the divorce and he could have stood up to the queen and said, I am marrying who I want to marry. That could have been entirely possible as evidenced by the fact he did eventually marry her when the queen was alive. I don't know, I don't know. I just, I'm, my point is, I have a lot more sympathy for all the players in this, not just Princess Diana. And historically, I feel like it's been weighted towards her. Princess Diana also really lost me when throughout the course of, you know, watching Spencer and The Crown and all of these things, a common theme bubbled up, which is how much emotional pressure she put on her children, on William and Harry, especially William, who, like Charles, never got a choice. He was, he was the heir. Harry was the spare, which is always what pissed me off about Harry's sob story. It's like, dude, you can go out and do whatever you want, which you did, which you absolutely did. And what is, what is your malfunction here? Why are you so put upon and pitiful when it's your brother who is carrying the shoulders of a thousand plus years of history? Not you, you don't have to do, you have to not wear a Nazi uniform in public. Have Nazi pajamas if you really need to, for God's sakes, but like, so Diana, yes, I think she, as the daughter of a single mom, as a woman who has had a therapist tell me, of course you didn't like being married. You were already wed to your mother. <sighs> so gross. I really feel for William because in all of these movies, and listen, of course they're movies, there's a creative license, but I haven't heard one person from Diana's past or a friend come out. I, I have never seen, maybe I missed it, but I've never seen someone come out and be like, that's not accurate. That's not accurate. But in all of these movies, she would say things like, you're my rock, William. You're my rock. And she would like tell him that I'm so unhappy. I'm so miserable. You're my rock. That is not appropriate. Do you know how much stress that puts on a child? You probably do because you might've been that child. I know because I was that child too. And I'm not saying this with any hatefulness towards my mother. Like I am obsessed with my mother. I'm wild about her. And we have a wonderful relationship and I had a wonderful childhood, but it growed me up fast. It did, you know? And I get real stressed real fast because I've been stressed since I was six. Like I heard, I just heard too many grown up things. I heard about credit card debt. I heard about politics. I heard about war in Iraq. I heard about this. Things that I don't think I should have heard yet, you know? <clears throat> and in some ways it made me empathetic. It made me smarter and sharper. Okay. Like, Hey, we don't all get to live in this little Disneyland fairy tale until we're like 18. It's like, what? I get it. You know, life is spiders. 
but it it's it's tough it's tough and so i was i felt for william in those scenes i was like oh oof. I know what that can do. And then I also feel for how deeply he must have felt the loss of his mother because it bonds you to that parent in a way that like is just really different. Yeah, that was always kind of my like, mm, Diana, something I've sort of realized about her. So what did Camilla do right here? What did Camilla do right? Because she waited it out. And now against all odds, the side chick, the side chick is the queen? What? The side chick is the queen. Sometimes it really is true love. And you know, it's interesting, like, is the only thing that separates a tragedy from a great love story time and outcome? Well, I mean, yes. And I think that is what keeps us holding on so much to someone toxic. Case in point, I hear girls tell me this all the time, that they lost their virginity to a guy. And it was not a great experience for whatever reason, fill in the blank. And they fixate on him and they want to make it work and they want to go visit him in his college and da, 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 and he's not interested and I'm crying. Da, da, da. I said, here's what's going on. If you can get with him and make him love you, then this is not just a sad story with a sad end. It's a maybe not great decision with a bad end. The end. It's, no, 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 no. It's just the drama that's necessary in an overall amazing love story with a wonderful end. So it wasn't a bad decision. It was the necessary drama in any great love story. I understand why we do that because we, we can't undo what happens, but we can, we can change the context. We can change where this fits into our overall narrative. And listen though, the way we do that is not by trying to nail Jeff, the guy who can't fuck, into a relationship, or Kyle, the guy who's put you in the friend zone, into a relationship. The way we do that while reading the writing on the wall and being like, that was a horrible way to lose my virginity. That was a, hor that was a sucky, Horrible way to lose my virginity, um, yeah, is to learn from it. And I know it's not as like razzle dazzle. It's like, I have a boyfriend now, it worked. It is much more razzle dazzle though, because it is making you a better person. And then you're gonna find a guy who you don't have to wedge into a relationship and you're not gonna have a bad sexual experience and he's not going to friend zone you and he's not gonna block you on social media. That None of that will ever happen. You will never have to endure this pain again if you can learn from it. If you don't, welcome to hell because this is where you live now. This is exactly the feeling you should get used to. Get real comfortable here because you're just going to keep repeating it. I promise you that that's true. You know why? Because I've lived it. I've, I, I have lived this. I want to touch on William and Kate. The press had called her Waity Katie, Waity Katie, before William and Kate were married. They've been married 10 years, but I remember when they were just dating and they dated for years before that and were like kind of friends before that at St. Andrews and whatever. And yeah, she was like the girl who just was waiting it out. Okay. Let's talk about how to figure out if this man is worth waiting for and if it's going to work to wait. Question number one, the only question, who is he? Is he worth waiting for? I actually had a friend who was dating a prince, like recently, not in like the 1600s. I'm old, I'm not that old. And she's like, I just, you know, I know he's not gonna be ready to get married for like four or five years. I don't know if I can wait. I'm like, for a prince? I think you can. And she was, <laughs> she's like, I mean, I guess that might, you know, if you're, and I was like, if you're gonna wait for anyone, yeah, maybe a prince, maybe a prince. But she didn't want to be that a princess. I'm not going to spill her business. But the, the, again, the job sounded not that cool. And it was a lot of it was a job. You know, you're not just like more grapes, boys. It's like a job and a boring one. So ask yourself, it's probably not a prince you're waiting for. Who the fuck is this guy? When I think about my Montana Hurt Locker, who I was like endlessly twisted over. And I'm like, I just need to wait for him to 
grow up or this or whatever, fill in the blank. My, I remember one of my friends saying to me, she's like in New York, she's like, who exactly told you that he's the only person you're allowed to date on planet earth? I was like, but I love him. And she said, okay, I get that. I get that. But tell me the things that you love about him. Like write them down on a piece of paper. Okay. The things you love now. And then draw your ideal him. Like this is fixed. That is fixed. This is fixed. He's sober. He um, has a good job and he loses weight. Let's say it's those two things. Whatever. Okay. She's like, do you, have you heard of, have you heard of men who already, right now, today, possess those three things? Have you heard of a man who is sober-ish, you know, not like, he's not an alcoholic, he has a good job, and he's in shape? Have you, have you heard tell of men like that? My point is, are you waiting for someone whose best self, which they aren't even are, they aren't even, they aren't even is completely replicable? That you can go out and find that right now. This is like starving to death when there's a grocery store across the street. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'll tell you what you're doing. You're doing that storyboarding. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. You are, no, 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 no. This wasn't just a bad call for six months. This was a, a bad six months, but then it was a lifetime of happiness. You're being a little chicken shit and you're refusing to say, I made a mistake. And the irony is everyone in your life who loves you would be thrilled to hear that. They would be so thrilled. No one, no one, when you are finally like, I am so done with him, no one's going to be like, yeah, you know, you really made a mistake. No one will say that. I know because when I said I was done with my heart locker, people were like, mm, Dios mio, thank God. Thank, we've been waiting for you to say this. And on some level, I thought I would hurt. It's like, yeah, you wasted like a year of your life. No, babe. They were like, you did not waste one more day. They're looking at a glass half full. Because let's say you wasted a year on this person. Because that's your big fear. That's your big fear. It's called the sunk cost fallacy or the sunk cost bias. And you see this with people who get tangled up with con artists and they know that they're being conned. They know that there's no return on investment and yet they keep writing checks and you're like, what are you doing, Martha? It's the sunk cost fallacy, maybe bias, that they, they don't want to admit to themselves and so they keep it going to avoid having to say, these costs are sunk. They're just sunk. But isn't it better to lose $1,000 than $2,000? Of course. Okay. Isn't it better to lose a year than a year and a half? Than a year and one day? Isn't it? And look, look, money is a thing. Money is a thing and you can actually lose it. I know you can say, well, time is definitely a thing and you can't make more time. That's true. But you can learn from this time. And now we go back to what we were saying earlier. Instead of trying to storyboard this bad thing into some magical, mystery, wonderful fairy tale through all these insane, difficult, ultimately unsuccessful machinations, what if you pulled back and you're like, surrender Dorothy, like in The Wizard of Oz, surrender, just surrender. And you could just say, what am I supposed to learn? What if I could just learn? What if I could just graduate from this? Instead of thinking about this as a failure, what if I could think of it as a graduation? Damn, that course was hard. What did I learn? I'm ready to graduate. I'm ready to move on. That was tough. I don't want to stay in that school forever. I'm ready to graduate. What did you learn? Did you learn something about red flags and maybe trusting them the first time you see them? Did you learn something about believing somebody when they tell you they don't want something or a situation or they don't like you? Did you learn something about believing actions over words? What did you learn? Did you learn that maybe you were latching onto someone to distract yourself from a lack of direction, a lack of physical fitness, a lack of friendships? Oh, that seems unfun, doesn't it? Well, yeah. 
it's, you're, you're already not having fun. You're already not having fun. You won't admit it to yourself, but you're in absolute misery. Misery. Why, what if you could switch this? And so the unfun was actually productive. You know, what if it's like you could go to sleep exhausted because you're worried and stressed and you hate your body, or you could go to sleep exhausted because you had a great workout, right? So that's first and foremost. Is this person even worth waiting for? And don't blame it on your kids. Don't blame it on your religion. Don't blame it. Well, he's my husband. Grow the fuck up. Is this man worth your life? If you found out tomorrow you had terminal cancer, how would you feel about this? Memento mori, as the Stoics say. Remember death. Remember death always. It's coming for us. And if death came later today, would we say, hopefully not, would we be like, I'm so glad I spent all that time on that person who didn't want to be with me? You think it's tough to swallow now? Try swallowing it then. But okay, that concludes the depressing portion of this video. Let's talk about when things work. Well, first of all, let's talk about the, first of all, do you guys like my hair like this? Do you like my bangs like this? You know I am about my bangs. It's an ever evolving battle. There's two ways that you're gonna be waiting for a guy. His circumstances aren't ideal. He's gotta graduate from law school. He's getting deployed. He's gotta pay off some debt so he can move out of his mom's house, okay? There's like a thing that's circumstantially making this not happen right now. Or the circumstance is actually him. It's his bullshit. He's immature, he doesn't have any direction, he's not over his ex, he's depressed, whatever, okay? One of these people is worth waiting for, and one is not. Can you guess which one is not? The one where the call is coming from inside the house. It's a self-created thing, okay? Where, and maybe it's not self-created in that depression isn't, always self-created, but it's something that he alone has control over fixing. Time will not magically fix it. External factors like the military releasing him from service or law school graduating him will not fix it. He alone has to take those steps. And if he's not taking those steps, that kind of says it all, right? If this is a logistical thing, yeah. If this person means that much to you and there's a light at the end of the tunnel, wait it out. If not, and you still love him, you have to do the thing that is going to feel the most antithetical, the most unnatural, and like the biggest, scariest bluff, because it is. You gotta cut him off, baby girl. You gotta cut him off. Because what that, that kind of man is, he's a child. He's a child. I don't know if I want a relationship. Uh, I just really wanna find myself. I think I'm gonna be a Twitch gamer. Okay, okay, Jackson. You know what? Men like that, and honestly, most men, they don't just magically decide to grow. They don't. They grow based on trauma, and we can be that trauma. They grow when they hit a rock bottom. They get fired from a job, they're gonna get back out there. They get dumped, they're gonna be a better man. Country music is full of examples of this. Literally every country song is, I woke up when she left me, I didn't realize what I had, I'm a better man now, blah, 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 blah. We have to be the thing, and I hate this, I hate this for us. We have to be that rock bottom. We have to be the thing that that bullshit behavior breaks against. And the only way we do that is by walking out the door. That is the only sound a man he hears is of your heels walking out his driveway. He doesn't hear, I'm gonna leave if you don't, doesn't hear it. He doesn't hear, I'm gonna start sleeping with friends, doesn't hear it. He doesn't hear threats. He doesn't hear, it makes me hurt this way when you do it like this, doesn't hear it. Men only hear silence, consistent silence. Cause all y'all motherfuckers out there are like, oh yeah, no, I really, I didn't talk to him for 36 hours and boy, I was mad. And I'm talking, I'm talking about my friends too. It's like, whoa, okay. 
all you're doing now is teaching him how short this time in the doghouse is. So you're giving him kind of an endurance test. You're making him a performance endurance athlete. He's like, oh, 36 hours? I got this. I can wait out 36 hours. Or maybe it's a week. I, got, I can wait out a week. He cannot know that there's an end to this. He can't know. And the way you do that is you're like, I'm just, I'm just gone. Bye. And you leave. There's not explanation. Let him figure the fuck out why. Men love a puzzle. They do. And again, country music is full of songs like this. Blindsided. That ain't no way to go. You and all your reasons. Huh? Why did she leave? I'm just so confused. Good. I want you to be confused. I don't want you to know. I want this to be the biggest distraction in your life that you're focusing in, 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 and you're going to try to, you're going to try everything you can think of to better yourself, to get my attention back. Oh, maybe, maybe it's because I was too fat. I don't know. Maybe it was Grady. Better at the gym. Maybe, maybe it's because I didn't make enough money. Yeah, Rob, probably not. Go get a better job. I want you, I want a man to go out there and do everything in every category to make himself the kind of man worthy of me, then maybe I'll consider telling him the actual problem. And guess what? It was probably all of those things. So if you are dealing with a guy who just needs to grow up, you grow him up by hurting him. You grow him up by cutting him down. It's unfortunate that this works. It is. I don't want this to work. I don't want this to work. I would love to tell you, oh no, like honest, open, emotional, vulnerable conversations, that works. Okay. That might work part, partly, but you have to put that with a consequence. That's the law. Hey, here's, here's my standard, here's my boundary, here's how I feel when you do that. Okay, that's the law. That's Penal Code uh, Statute 928.5. Don't break into a car, okay? What is the law without law enforcement? It's just like, like this nice idea, like just don't like break into a car, <laughs> don't do that. Law without enforcement is chaos. Law without enforcement is anarchy. It's nothing. It doesn't exist, it's bullshit. Where's the law enforcement for you? What have you enforced? I have a friend who's dealing with a deadbeat brother and her, she's at her wits end. Her parents are at the wits end, but the parents support him. And I'm like, okay, what consequences has he ever faced? Well, we're all really mad. I said, no, 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 no. That's the law. That's the law written down. Where's the law enforcement? Where's the, where the handcuffs? Where's the time in jail? Where's the repossession of property? All the things that the law in, does. What is, where is that? Nothing. Not one, not one thing, not one thing to tell that person, no, no more. So you gotta ask yourself, are you just doodling in your diary about what the law is? Are you a motherfucking cop? Cause I am not just a cop, I am a warlord. I will slap the cuffs on a man so quick. And I don't really feel the need to explain myself. You know what the law is. You know what the law is. I shouldn't have to read you the law for you to know it. I shouldn't have to tell you, please don't repost some insane bitch that's trying to make it seem like you guys are sleeping together because when you do that, you just validate her. I shouldn't have to tell you that, that that's disrespectful to me as a woman. That's the law. You should know what the law is. That's not a minute little bylaw. Oh, I didn't know. Is that just a regional thing? Nope. That's what every woman in the world would consider part of the law. So I shouldn't need to tell you that. And so when I cut you off and I say I'm done, and you don't understand, just like if you've ever like been in trouble with the law, you will know that saying, I didn't know that is not a defense. Every lawyer in the world will be like, yeah, no, that's not a defense. You not knowing is not like a license to do whatever you want, <laughs> okay? And people go abroad and they do dumb things. And like, I didn't know you couldn't do that. Tough shit, sweetheart. Your study abroad is gonna last about 20 years longer. <laughs> yes, welcome to Thailand. It doesn't work that way. So. What is your law written down and what the fuck is your enforcement? Otherwise, we're just clowns out here. We're just clowns. Okay, what have we covered? If it's a logistical thing. 
Here's a big thing. Let's, let's pivot away from the douches. Let's pivot into the guys where it is logistical. I know, I know. I just said, men hear silence. These open and honest conversations, they're great, they're the law, but where's the law enforcement? For sure. But you know when the law doesn't work? When there's not even the law that's written down. When there's not even that. Where am I going with this? Is the guy you're waiting for asking you to wait? Girl, is he asking you? Well, yeah, I mean, we see each other all the time. He tells me how much he likes me. That's not the same thing. Has he said the words, when I get out of deployment, we are moving in together. When I get my law degree, I'm gonna put a ring on your finger. When I move out of my mom's place, we're gonna start apartment hunting. Has he said that? Well, I've, I've brought it up. Has he ever brought it up? I know, I'm dragging you to hell right now. I know that, but I would rather you be mad at me. I would, because I love you. Then figure this out the hard way three years from now and be mad at yourself because that's when you get locked in that spiral of bitterness and you're in the victim narrative and it's a nightmare and you can't get out of it. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. So I would rather this be a <gasps> moment for you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I would rather you hear it from me than hear it from the world in terms of behavior and consequences. Is he even asking? Is he, is he making any sort of promises? Because look, talk in and of itself, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap, right? But it's still something. I mean, if a, that's the point. Talk is so cheap, and if a man won't even bother to do that, what does that say? What does that say? If he doesn't care enough to string you along, well, he's a good guy and he wouldn't do that. Then he's not into, then, then that's your answer. Then. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, if he's not bullshitting you. But let's say he is. Let's, let's look on the, again, glass half full. Let's say he's like, no, he's, he's like, I just, I'm trying to save this amount of money. I want to pay off my credit card debt, blah, blah, blah. I think it's important to, you know, we got to see through some bullshit. And it's like, I have some friends who are like, well, they really want kids and the guys are like, well, it's expensive and I just want to save up enough money, enough money. I would just want to save some money. And I'm like, oh, well, how much money? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I said, you haven't asked him that? Like get granular about this. Men are very granular creatures. They're logistical. They communicate to solve problems. They're problem solving in their head. If they don't deal in vagaries, they don't. And so if he truly has a plan for your life, that hinges on a dollar amount or a location or a degree or whatever that is, one like a thing, and he can't name that, then it's it's a bunch of bullshit. It's bullshit. And he can't, he needs to do more than just name it because he could be like, uh, I want to save five hundred thousand dollars. Like, okay. Does he have a plan? Because again, talk is cheap, and that's just a stall tactic. Like, oh no, he says that he says we're gonna have a baby once we've saved enough for a down payment for a house. Is it realistic you guys are going to save that down payment by the time you are still fertile enough to have children? Does that work for your timeline? Do you know what I mean? Like, are you only hearing what I want, what you want to hear? Is there a plan? Because time has its own plan. Time is running clocks out. And that is just, that is just the brutal truth of it. But time isn't running his clock out, not the way it's running yours. And this has nothing to do, well, it has something to do. Of course, that means babies, but also just perky tit years, hotness. You think it's hard to start over now? Try doing it a decade from now. Pickens are slimmer, titties are lower. Not always great. So if this person is asking you to wait, what kind of plan does he have? Ask, ask him, it's like, okay, well, what kind of plan do you have? What's your timeline? This is my timeline. Because you know what, girl? I've been married and it was not successful. Do you know why? 
because we didn't we did not approach our marriage as a business partnership we approached it like we were bfgf just like in the honeymoon phase just having fun we didn't talk about finances we didn't have a plan for our future we didn't have spreadsheets all these like icky logistical things those are the things that actually make marriages work sex does too that was also an issue but we didn't do the grown-up shit and if you're trying to have a grown-up relationship and you're making grown-up plans you need to have grown-up conversations if he won't there's a reason he doesn't think of you that way he just doesn't that's the way it is and that sucks but it sucks so much more to be the last one to know years down the line so listen if he's out there being a playboy being a fuck boy great you can always harbor affection for him. Like that's kind of how I felt about my Montana Hurt Locker. It's like, I'll love him for so long. And if he came back into my life in a really big, bold, legitimate, respectful, you know, gentleman pursuiter kind of way, I'd give it a shot. But yo, life goes on. Like I'm going out there, I'm dating people, I'm meeting people and that, that should scare him. That should scare him. If he thinks I'm never gonna meet somebody that would compete with him, I mean, I already have like five times over, you know, so that's that's not great for him. But go out there and do your thing. Go out there and do your thing. Men can't miss what they haven't lost and they don't value, they don't value something that's too available. So let me know what you guys think. Tell me your thoughts on the coronation. Are you watching? Do you care? Tell me what you think about my bangs. Did you wait for a guy? What did you say to him? Did it work? Did it not work? How much time did you invest? What would you say to a younger woman thinking who may be in like a similar situation? You know, tell us in the comments. I got you, Shalligators.